Good morning. It's good to see so many of you here today. This time I'm going to lean this direction. All right. You can't see that, but I can. Uh, today is the seventh Sunday after Trinity, the Sunday of the feeding of the 4,000, our Lord graciously providing uh, us with daily bread. We'll hear about that today. And as such, it's appropriate to hear about our Good Shepherd Jesus and the way he leads us to green pastures here to be fed by his word. And we'll do that with the opening hymn, The King of Love, My Shepherd Is, hymn 709. Our service is Divine Service Setting 1, page 151. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us.
Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we to be feared, a great King over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us, nations under our feet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our God, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with a song. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Clap your hands, all peoples, Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord the Most High is to be feared, a great King over all the earth. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, have
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose never failing providence orders all things both in heaven and earth, we humbly implore you to put away from us all hurtful things and to give us those things that are profitable for us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the seventh Sunday after Trinity is from Genesis chapter 2. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Delium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. This is the word of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. Shout for joy in the Lord, all you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with a lyre. Make melody to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast law of the Lord. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap, He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. 
The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their hope. The epistles from Romans chapter 6. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd, and they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people, and he sent them away. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will faint on the way for some of them have come from afar. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The miracles of Jesus are incomprehensible to reason and experience. No one can take seven loaves and a few small fish and feed some 4,000 households. It's really impossible and even absurd. And that's how the disciples responded. From Matthew's account, the disciples said to him, where could we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? Jesus doesn't follow the rules of nature or the economy of earthly life. In this world, it's always one for one, this for that. The appropriate amount of food for the appropriate amount of people. You only get what you put in. Matter cannot be created or destroyed. As a congregation of Christ's church and as your pastor, I think it would be the most blessed problem. Imagine if the Holy Spirit chose to gather to us thousands to hear God's word proclaimed here. What would we do? Would we whine and complain about how we don't have the means to accommodate so many coming to us? And no doubt we'd start crunching the numbers in despair of our church building, that it would be too small, or the parking lot, the streets and the fields, not even being able to accom accommodate the number. And most definitely, we'd have nowhere near enough volunteers. It's not possible, you think, for the Spirit to do such a thing. We could never accomplish it. But such is the economy of the Christian church. I'm reminded of a small congregation in a suburb of Berlin. Maybe you know this story. And Pastor Martins was there. And because of the manipulated, forced, or otherwise immigration into Germany, they ended up with many uh, Muslim immigrants in and around Berlin. These immigrants began to see visions of Jesus, calling them to this Lutheran congregation outside of Berlin, a small congregation, less than 100 typically on a Sunday like this. Now a congregation has grown by the Spirit, many of these who visited converting, numbering in the thousands. Went from less than 100 to a few thousand in just a few short years. You could blame it on the politics of Germany, or you could say it was the work of the Holy Spirit. And they thankfully rose to the challenge, Spirit giving them the gifts needed. You see how the economy of the Christian church really is impossible and absurd. But again, impossible and absurd only by our reason and our own expectations and experience. And really, that means then, to say it's impossible or absurd is it's actually the voice of unbelief speaking. That's because Jesus' kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the Christian church, is not governed by the world's thoughts of what is right and wrong, good and evil, that knowledge gained from that tree in the garden. Jesus' kingdom is not governed by power and wealth. It doesn't mimic the way we tried to build community, our poor attempts of providential care for the needy and the poor and the sick. Fundamentally, it can't behave the same way. The world can't because Christ's kingdom is built by a very different word, the word of Jesus. That same word that we heard today made all things and kept making and keeps making out of nothing. So Jesus is the word of the Father that says, let there be, and then there is. We say that matter can't be created or destroyed, but yes, it can, and only by God the creator.
So, a little break. In this Christian church, God the Father speaks his son, Jesus, the word, to continually make all things new. He is doing, even now, what for you and me cannot be done. It's impossible and absurd for some 4,000 to follow after Jesus for three days into the wilderness. Why would they dare to do such a thing? It's impossible and absurd for them to believe that Jesus would take care of them, even in that desolate place in that wilderness. How could they even believe that? And even if Jesus did accomplish that, it's impossible and absurd that one man could feed so many with so little. And that's the point. It's far past the point of reason and experience. Again, the economy of the Christian church, Christ's kingdom, does not mimic the kingdoms of this world. Your king, Jesus, demands nothing of you, but gives you everything as a free gift of his goodness and mercy. Good luck finding another kingdom that behaves that way. The gospel shows us that Christ Jesus is a gracious and merciful benefactor, always eager to help and accompany and associate with everyone. And for this reason, the people were also eager to accompany him, to follow him, to observe and listen to him, so that even their houses and the streets were emptied of people. Better to be in church. So wherever he turned, whether it was up the mountain or into the wilderness or over the sea, they followed. They were not bothered by the difficulty of the journey or how strenuous the hike was up the mountain or how perilous the waves and winds were upon the sea. In this world, the great, mighty, and rich are eager to avoid such thoughts about a multitude of poor people. Well, that's so you can have peace and quiet. But Christ Jesus does not do that. These are precisely who he cares for, he has compassion for. Jesus is even willing to have his peace robbed of him so that the poor will not be neglected concerning salvation. That's why to your family and friends and neighbors, all the time and effort and wealth that you spend to preserve God's word here and the gifts of his forgiveness, it seems to them an extraordinary waste. Your offering subsidy of a Lutheran day school makes no sense when you look at the numbers. The care and upkeep of this historic sanctuary, dedicated to really only one purpose, the reception of God's word in sacraments, that doesn't make sense either. Why couldn't we just meet in the gymnasium and let the church building just rot away? Or even think about the way that they think of the hours you pray and confess and sing, daily living in the forgiveness of sins. Think about all the other ways you could use that time. And I could go on. It's all absurd. The amount of time, effort, and wealth that we seemingly squander on this congregation and on growing in the faith, it is absurd to reason and experience. But maybe we just think a little too small. Or rather, maybe we think that we are too small for God's effort. We don't dare God to give us more because we don't believe that he would then also give us what we would need. And so when he gives us little, we think God a miser. Why aren't there more people in church today? as if it's some judgment against us too. If only we were doing the right things in the eyes of the kingdom of this world or in the eyes of our sinful flesh, then the multitudes will come out to the proverbial wilderness two miles north of Random Lake. But neither of those ideas are true. We're not to apply the worldly kingdom rules to Christ's kingdom. Christ Jesus will do what he desires, when and where he pleases. The Spirit blows when and where he wills. But Jesus has given you promises. And Jesus promises his Spirit will call, gather, enlighten, and sanctify you and the whole Christian church on earth and keep you with him. And in this Christian church, he promises that he will daily and richly provide you with everything needed for faith and life forgiveness of sins, and daily bread. 
Yes, daily bread is given to everyone even without their prayers. Clearly, the 4,000 believe that. But we are given to see that everything we have been given is a gift from God, from his gracious, merciful hands. That's why we can say thanks regardless of what he gives, whether it is much, 4,000 households, or whether it's little, just seven loaves and a few fishes. Either way, we have his promises and his word cannot fail. To reason and experience such faith is impossible and even absurd. We believe that God will provide for us because we trust him and cling to his word. And his word stands firm. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. It is God's ordering that we Christians first pray, attend divine service, listen to preaching and teaching, be forgiven in his body and blood, praise and thank God, and after that, proceed to our work and home. We see how the 4,000 households were so fervent and eager for God's word that they even stayed with the Lord Christ for three days, even as he led them out into a desolate place. And there he provided for them. And of course, too, we should treat our neighbor as Christ treats us, as faithful disciples, distributing as the Lord has given, not ungrateful or ungracious. Our neighbors, be they a few dozen or a few thousand, are gifts to us, too, from the Lord's loving and gracious hands. Even creation confesses that. The field cries out, Behold, O man, I give you grain for food. Even the vineyard sings, I give you wine for your drink, without you asking. Even the sheep says, here's wool for your clothing. Only judgment comes upon those who do not show mercy, as they've been shown mercy. So we are called not to abuse the good things that we've received from God, or shamefully squander them, that's true, to take them and use them, keep them with care to enjoy them with moderation, thank God for them, and use them to help our neighbor. But it doesn't need to be according to a ledger sheet, according to a balanced budget. It doesn't have to make any economic sense. But it's by love, according to need, trusting that the Lord will continue to provide for that need. If it does make economic sense to you, the mercy and mission work of the church, you're probably thinking about them all wrong. That's not how Christ's kingdom behaves. Even though God gives all things richly and sufficiently, our sinful hearts and the world tends to one of two extremes. Either it, it keeps them so that no one can enjoy them with the barns you'll hear about, or it abuses and squanders them so that they're no good to anyone, wasting what God has given said, we're called to be different, as the Spirit has given us to be. said, we're called to thank God for all his benefits, to be gracious and merciful toward our neighbor, to help him serve and counsel him, and to trust that God will continue to provide for that need. And Jesus promises us that we will hear these comforting words when he does come again. Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom that is prepared for you from the beginning of the world. For whatever you did to these, my lowliest brethren, you did it unto me. And then we all will enter into the wedding feast, into eternal life. May God strengthen our faith and keep us with Jesus today and always. In his holy name. Amen. Amen. We confess our common Christian faith and show love for one another by confessing together the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of life, light of
being reconciled with the Father by him, all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. On the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, our King over all the earth, reigning over the nations, sitting on your holy throne, graciously receive our prayers and praises. Subdue the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh under the feet of your people, that we may share in the victory Christ has won for us. Lord, in your mercy, Lord of the earth, our Savior multiplied bread and fish and fed over 4,000 people in Gentile territory, thereby showing your kingdom is open to all nations. Bless and protect the work of our missionaries in this country and around the world, that all people would receive the bread of everlasting life given in the word and sacraments. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, pour out the blessing of your Holy Spirit on the delegates who will assemble in convention this week. Give wisdom to those who propose, deliberate, and decide for the work and welfare of our synod. Guard all who speak and all who listen. Give us courage to do with integrity what we promise. Bless our plans and actions and grant success. Only let our manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Creator and preserver of all things, you govern and sustain the, the earth for our good and provide for all our needs of body and soul. Bless the labor of those who produce food and shelter, safety and peace. Lead us to recognize your gracious hand in all things and to receive our daily bread with thanksgiving. Lord, in your mercy. Lord and giver of life, you formed us from the dust of the earth and breathed into us your own breath of life. All people are made in your image and have dignity and worth in your sight. Defend your gift of earthly life at every age, from natural conception unto natural death. We also celebrate with those who rejoice in the life you have given. This week, those celebrating their birthday, Kara, Chris, Robbie, Nolan, Jody, and Deb, those rejoicing in the gift of new life and baptism, Jackie, Ryan, Wyatt, Tom, Savannah, and Joan, those who rejoice in the gift of wedded life, Ron and Nancy, Tom and Sandy, Tim and Kim. We pray for all our households that you would bless them with life, especially this week with Don and Karen, Michael and Michelle, Mariah, Paul, Ron and Sandra, Jan and Donna. Lord, in your mercy. Hear us, Father, for those who have asked us to pray for them, who are in any need. We especially pray for those receiving treatment, those who are ill, those who are recovering, especially Dale and Pam, Joe, Melanie, Kelsey, Christopher, Marcy, Brad, Gus, Eileen, Ron, Doug, Bev, 
Joan, Pat, Wendell, Darlene, Donna, who is being treated for a stroke, and all those whom we now name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God of grace, as your Son miraculously fed thousands in the wilderness, today feed your people gathered here with the true bread from heaven, the body and blood of Christ, our Savior, that even in the wilderness of this world, we may share in the eternal life of paradise now. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, in holy baptism, you claimed us as your own holy people in your Son. Strengthen and preserve us in this holiness that we might not give ourselves over again to the slavery of sin and lawlessness leading to death, but instead to the slavery of righteousness that leads to eternal life. This we ask through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to greet one another with the peace of Christ. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, 
Almighty Father, everlasting God, through who Jesus Christ our Lord, who having created all things, took on human flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary. For our sake he died on the cross and rose from the dead to put an end to death, thus fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, 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 not in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna on him, the highest. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world.
We stand. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Part in his peace. Amen. Amen. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming, we may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
may be seated. I neglected to put on the screen, so I'll just make a verbal announcement. Uh, I'm taking my family out of town for a week, so uh, I guess pastors get breaks too sometimes. Uh, as far as you're concerned, most things won't be any different. There'll still be a congregation prayer each day. Wednesday evening is a office of Vespers, so a prayer service led by uh, Don's going to lead that. So you can still join us Wednesday evening. Next Sunday, you'll have a guest preacher, because I'll still be gone. And that would be uh, Reverend Courtright, who lives in Sheboygan. He just recently retired. He was a um, theological instructor at the seminary in Riga, Latvia. Anybody been to Latvia or Latvian? No, okay. So maybe he can tell you a few things about that. Um, but he recently retired and lives in Sheboygan. His wife has played organ for us before, so I got a, a double deal. I got the pastor and the organist for next Sunday. How's that? Are you excited? Okay, good. Eh, you don't have to be excited. I'm, I'm glad for it. Um, so he's going to lead the service. She'll lead you in singing. So beautiful. Uh, let's see. So if you have a, a pastoral emergency, um, you can reach out to me. I'll still have my cell and whatnot. I might not respond to you right away, but... Um, you can always contact uh, Don or Mike if you need something immediately, or uh, Pastor Peitch is our circuit visitor, um, and I have arrangements for pastoral care in an event of emergency, so uh, we can handle that if we need to. Okay, uh, this week, Thursday, right, is Music in the Park. The sign-up board is still out there, so if you haven't volunteered or um, signed up for donations, do that today, now, and then that will be done. Uh, and then also we have the pick uh, the uh, parade. Where's Jenny? Jenny's back there, right? Any, any details I need to know for that or announce? Yeah. Um, we built the float. Floats built? Okay. Um, so the parade starts at noon on Sunday, next Sunday, so me and Lake High School, if you want to join us, we'll walk in. Right. So after church, you've got a little bit of a break, no Bible study. You can go and march in the, in the uh, parade, the fireman's parade, right? And uh, support our school and church that way. All right. We have Bible class here in a few minutes. We're going to be done with the uh, oracles of judgment. Thanks be to God. And uh, you can be a part of that too. So be with you all. Good to see you.